So um, let me introduce uh, tonight's talk and tonight's speaker. Uh, and uh, I feel an especial affinity, I think, for the <coughs> subject of tonight's uh, talk for, for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously, anybody who writes, who works with language, which I think applies to probably everybody in this room, I is aware of, of the ambiguous paradoxical character of language, the difficulty of using the thing that promises you the freedom to communicate. Um, but not everybody is conscious of a particular linguistic problem that only a few languages in a few countries have, because uh, I, and, and I guess anybody in this country, uh, grew up um, inheriting a language that's had a continuous tradition for centuries, uh, for better and for worse. You, you have to work within this long, long tradition. As it happens, uh, there is a country, the country that I work on, modern Greece, where, in fact, uh, the um, triumph of a national movement brought with it a whole set of arguments about what was the appropriate uh, linguistic vehicle for this new nation. And there was an effort that really roiled the country for a century and a half, two centuries, from the 1820s into the 1970s and the end of the junta, to impose upon people what was in a sense a new language, except it was also a version of a very old language. It was ancient Greek that was then transformed into what some people thought was a new, fitting new national language. And when you have uh, um, examples like that, they throw up very interesting questions about language. The other example uh, is uh, the one that we're going to be hearing about this evening. Uh, and I feel some affinity there too, because one of my great-grandfathers just over a century ago was a speaker on the other side of the barricades from this, he was at a conference that was held in Chernovitz, the Habsburg city of Chernovitz in 1908, at which the delegates were arguing about uh, what the language of the Jewish people should be, and in particular, whether there should be a, a one or multiple languages, and the delegates of the Chernovitz conference came down strongly, not on the side of Hebrew, but on the side of Yiddish. Well, tonight, we're going to hear about Hebrew and what happens to Hebrew when it was bound up with the national revival uh, in Ottoman Palestine and then, of course, continued after the independence of Israel. And here, too, as in the Greek case, the, the, um, the emergence of a new nation was, was bound up with the really very, very intense and interesting language debates. Uh, debates over what, in particular, I think I should leave it to tonight's speaker to tell you because nobody is really, I think, doing more interesting work uh, on this important subject uh, than Ronnie Hennig, um, who did her dissertation at Columbia uh, with Dan Miron, uh, looking into a whole set of issues around Hebrew as a vehicle for national revival. Uh, before that, uh, she did her BA in uh, Literature and Creative Writing, which she got from Tel Aviv University. She was a lecturer in the Department of Middle East, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia. And uh, when, unfortunately, she leaves the Institute of Paris, she's going to go on and take up a position as an assistant professor in New York University, for which we congratulate her. So I'm going to shut up and hand over to Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie, floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you, Mark. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to be here at the Institute. And I have to start by telling you what a wonderful year I'm having. Um, this has really been an exceptional experience, and I'm enjoying every second of it. So first, I want to thank uh, the Institute staff, James, <coughs> Eve, Marie, and Mark, of course, and, and the entire st staff of Reed Hall for your incredible hospitality. Um, really, we, we are so well taken care of here, so that's, um, 
that's not obvious, and, and I really appreciate that. And I also want to thank my fellow fellows whose um, presence and company have inspired me to reflect on my work from unusual perspectives. And we just this past month, we, we actually had two talks already, two fascinating talks by Eduardo Khalfon and by Bushra Khalili last week. And I think they represent the more artistic side of the Institute. So today, um, I'm going to bring us back to academia. I'm a little bit sorry to say that. But um, in the spirit of the Institute, I'm going to try and do something that I don't normally do. And that is to share very briefly um, what drew me to, to this project that I'm working on here. Um, which is a book project um, that, uh, as uh, Mark uh, told you, basically revolves around the question of uh, language revival in modern Hebrew literature. So I will start by very briefly sharing how I came to be interested in this topic. Then I will talk more generally about what Hebrew revival is or what I think we should ask about it. So I'm going to talk about the book in general. And finally, I will share a literary um, example through the work of the national poet Chaim Nachman Bialik, uh, which hopefully will tie everything together. So here goes. And please let me know if you can't hear me. Okay. I was born in Israel in 1985. Growing up in the 80s and 90s in central Israel, my relationship to the Hebrew language was always fraught and ambivalent. This was my mother tongue, my only spoken language. I was born into it. There was no choice involved. Other languages existed in my midst, but they were, for the most part, impenetrable. They existed mostly as sounds or sensations without words. My grandmother's Tunisian French, seasoned with Arabic expressions, my grandfather is Egyptian Arabic. On my Ashkenazi side, Yiddish, which was well hidden beneath my grandparents' Hebrew. So these languages were and they weren't. They weren't for me, that is. An invisible wall stood before them, made them unapproachable. Hebrew was my language. A language of everyday life, of the suburbs, of mundane reality. Hebrew was the language of television, of commercials and news broadcasts, of pop culture and grungy 90s rock music. But there was always something off, not quite fitting in Hebrew. Its attempt to be cool, American-like, was pathetic. It was way too formal to be sassy, but almost too colloquial and vulgar when attempting to be witty. The range was non-existent. The gap between linguistic registers was insurmountable. For me, Hebrew often left a stale taste. It was too plain, too flat. Of course, the Hebrew of my childhood was also a language of politics, the language of the nation state, a militarist language. It was the language of occupation, of armed forces, of power, violence, and control. Often in my life, I hated it as such. But there was something more, an evasive, unexplainable quality to Hebrew, which made it different, poetic, sacred perhaps, or not. I first encountered this quality in literature, and I shall add in literature translated into Hebrew as I spent most of my adolescent life reading Hebrew Virginia Woolf. There she is. Hebrew Cervantes, Hebrew Joyce, and Hebrew Kafka, what fabulous irony it was reading Kafka in Hebrew. And here you can see Kafka's own attempt to learn Hebrew. Um, if you can read Hebrew, you'll spot the mistakes. In this juvenile attempt to stray away as far as I could from banal Israeli reality, to read and master world literature, to become educated, to become more accurately European, it was in this sentimental and colonized attempt, paradoxically, that I discovered Hebrew as an alluring mystery which echoed unknown layers and contained sounds and words I often did not know but was hypnotized by. Later in life, I found this evasive quality even more forcefully in the magnetic words of Hebrew writers, of Yosef Chaim Brenner, David Fogel, and Shmuel Yosef Agnon, of Onit Matalon, Orly Kastelblum, Anton Shamas, and Shimon Adaf. 
when I came to New York for my doctoral studies, already in my 20s, distant from Hebrew, from Israel, and from the buzzing scene of its tiny but outspoken intellectual leftist community, I became gradually interested in the processes that had turned Hebrew into the deceiving, miraculous, sacred and profane two-faced language I have come to know. In search of a different reflection of Hebrew, I started reading about Hebrew revival. So revival, the Hebrew tchia, is a noun derived from the root chaya, which means live, to live. Similar but not identical to the English revival, it encodes the positive significance of renaissance and reawakening, but also implies the non-living state of its object, which is in need of revival or revitalization. The revival of Hebrew is a foundational concept in the history of modern Hebrew literature, and it was a major concern for early 20th century Hebrew writers. The question of language revival was at the forefront of Hebrew literary production of the time, and it was the subject of many heated debates. Before the 20th century, Hebrew, which now is the formal language spoken in Israel, was considered a non-spoken language. While it existed in both religious and secular literature, it was rarely employed in everyday conversation. Discussions about the revival of Hebrew dates to the 19th, even late 18th century. But revival meant different things in different moments, and it also meant different things to different people. In the 19th century, with the emergence of Jewish enlightenment in Europe, Haskalah, the notion of speaking Hebrew was barely imaginable. So revival in that context meant a cultural movement entwined with notions of secularism and nationalist awakening, which transformed major avenues in Jewish life. Towards the end of the 19th century, however, and particularly with the consolidation of Zionism, Hebrew revival gradually came to signify the emergence of Hebrew speech as well, the colloquialization of Hebrew as a vernacular, a spoken national language. And so in the 1920s, a bewildered young Gershom Sholem could walk around in Palestine and hear the sacred Hebrew, Hebrew words uttered on the street. This renowned German Jewish scholar of Jewish mysticism, who was born in 1897 in Berlin and emigrated to Palestine in 1923, would later express his astonishment in a letter to another German Jewish scholar, Franz Rosenzweig. Written in December of 1926, this letter describes an apocalyptic vision in which the sacred language threatens to break out one day in a volcanic manner against those who speak it. So we'll read a little bit from this letter. This country is a volcano. It houses language, Sholem writes about 1920s Palestine. One speaks here of, of the many things that could make us fail. One speaks more than ever today about the Arabs. But more uncanny than the Arab people, another threat confronts us that is a necessary consequence of the Zionist undertaking. What, what about the actualization of Hebrew? Must not this abyss of a sacred language handed down to our children break out again? Sholem's letter is by now a widely well-known text read and commented upon by numerous thinkers from Stefan Moses to Jacques Derrida. It was first published and translated from the German uh, after Sholem's death, about 60 years after it was um, written in 1985, the year I was born. <coughs> Hebrew is pregnant with, with catastrophes. It cannot and will not remain in its current state. Our children no longer have another language, and it is only too true to say that they, and they alone, will pay for the encounter which we have initiated without asking, without even asking ourselves. Many scholars point out that the problem that Sholem raises, the catastrophe to which he alludes, is a political one. It concerns the country, the Zionist undertaking, and the uncanny proximity of the Arab people. At the same time, it is a problem of language, a danger as well as a desire that is inherent in a particular enactment of language, in a particular manner of speech. 
That particular enactment of language not only presupposes the elimination of surrounding languages, it also compromises or perhaps ignores an abyssal essence that is inherent in the language, an essence that is inseparable from the multilingual condition of Hebrew. The text draws heavily on Kabbalistic terminology, attributing to words um, a creative, perhaps also vindictive power that might break out precisely against the, the backdrop of that ignorance. We do live inside this language above an abyss, almost all of us, with the certainty of the blind, Sholem proclaims. Derrida has argued in his reading of this letter that it is difficult to know what, whether what is more terrible for Sholem is to walk on the surface as a blind man, or to fall into the abyss as a man of lucid speech, awake, vigilant, awakened to the abyssal essence of the language. So there is an unresolvable tension here. As if the apocalyptic power that is enclosed in each and every word is somehow endangered and needs to be safeguarded. The abyssal essence of language, threatening as it may be, is one and the same with that in language which needs to be protected. And we might want to remember that, that notion for later on. Sholem further notes in the letter that this inescapable revolution of the language is the sole object of which nothing is said in this country. I argue, however, that within the terrain of early 20th century Hebrew literature, the revolutionary transformation of Hebrew and the anxiety it evokes is what everyone speaks of constantly. In other words, Sholem echoes, albeit in an apocalyptic rap, a prevailing sentiment of the literary discourse of Hebrew revival, which actually occurred much earlier, earlier than 1926. And that is precisely the discourse and the sentiment that my book tackles. So what I discovered about Hebrew revival that was so intriguing to me is that these so-called mixed feelings about the revival of Hebrew are present in so many texts that so much anxiety but also desire and hope is invested in the thought of language. And it seems to me that Hebrew as a reviving language is often perceived as weak, as if it needs to be saved by its revivers. But it is also seen as overwhelmingly powerful. And I'm drawn to that awkward zigzagging dynamics in the relationship to Hebrew, and to the idea that revival constituted Hebrew as the steering, bubbling matter, and enormous creative pot potential which the horizon of monolingualism and the nation state constantly threatens to flatten. In the book, I trace the ways in which some of the major writers of the modern Hebrew literary canon in the beginning of the 20th century and late 19th century understood, experienced, and to some extent produced uh, what they called the revival of the Hebrew language. So I attend to the question of revival first and foremost from a literary perspective. Reading a set of texts by prominent authors um, and thinkers, you can see some of them here, um, and these texts were written in shifting cultural uh, centers and circulated in places like Odessa, Warsaw, and Palestine, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and, and the Middle East. And put together, they provide a range of nuances in the articulation of revival and really set up um, set a set of moments in, in the revival uh, of Hebrew. So. Hebrew literary historiography usually frames the revival of Hebrew as a discrete unitary event, a heroic successful revolution that eventually resulted in the establishment of the Israeli state. In Israeli collective memory, the story is even further reduced, and the entire project of revival is commonly attributed to Eliezer ben Yehuda, the lexicographer and uh, editor who is believed to have prompted revival single-handedly by instituting new Hebrew vocabulary. In both cases, though, the revival of Hebrew is seen as a cornerstone in the emergence of Zionist consciousness and in the establishment of the Israeli state. Revival is celebrated as a linear process which had a beginning and ending, and revival literature is broadly understood as a necessary stage in this process which brought about the vital um, awakening of the language, the emergence of Hebrew as a language spoken by the masses, a language of the nation state. However, a closer examination of central revival texts that were actually produced in this seminal moment often reveals very different sentiments. 
It shows, among other things, that the poetics of revival is embedded not only in metaphors of revitalization, in re revitalization, awakening, and birth, as we might expect, but it is also invested in a terminology of loss, pain, and suffering. In fact, revival literature is infatuated with morbid or otherwise non-living creatures, golems, Spectres, puppets, ventriloquized mutes, and sick or wounded bodies inhabit the, discurs the discursive realm of revival and reemerge throughout its reflective discussions. I argue that while modern Hebrew literature largely rejected the assumption that Hebrew was ever a dead language, it nevertheless produced a discourse around the notion of revival in a manner that deferred the possibility of perceiving Hebrew as fully living. Dwelling on that ambivalence and suspension um, of that moment within Hebrew literature, I show that revival literature repeatedly situates Hebrew in a liminal space that lies between the dead and the living. I further argue that the space of the living dead can be read as constitutive of Jewish nationalism. So in the book, I essentially offer a critical analysis of the narrative by which Hebrew came to inhabit all of these new um, discursive roles, taking into consideration the reservations, the contradictions, the melancholic tone, and the violent gestures that are prevalent in the story of the revival of Hebrew. Rather than taking the success of linguistic revival for granted, I trace the processes whereby Hebrew came to be understood as a modern national language capable of transforming the identity of its speakers. And as I mentioned, the way in which I attempt to do all of that is by reading texts uh, and by excavating some of the alternative stories of revival that I believe these, many of these texts tend to um, contain. And one such example which I've, sh which I've chosen to share with you today uh, is found in the work of one of the most, if not the most prominent figures of, uh, of the modern Hebrew literary canon. Um, this is the poet Chaim Nachman Bialik. Um, so first, to this day, Bialik is considered the national um, poet of Israel, even though he died before the establishment of, of the Israeli state. Bialik was born in 1873 in a village nearby Zhitomir in the Russian Empire. He was educated in the traditional cheder and later attended the renowned Volozhin Yeshiva. So this is to say that like many Hebrew writers of his time, Bialik received traditional Orthodox education, which also included thorough Hebrew studies. So that would be the source of his Hebrew knowledge. But like practically all other Hebrew writers of the time, he was also expo exposed to secular knowledge, um, to the literature of, of Jewish enlightenment, of Haskalah, uh, and to European literatures. So writing Hebrew poetry at the time uh, would usually be the result of some kind of break with that traditional uh, world, and that also tells you a little bit about the paradoxical condition of modern Hebrew literature, um, which, um, whose writing, as, at that very important moment um, was done by people who were in between worlds, in between the orthodox world and the secular world, not really fitting into any of them. Um, in 1905, Bialik published a Hebrew essay titled Language Pangs, Chevlei Lashon in Hebrew. It could also be translated as the birth pangs of language. In this essay, Bialik addresses the birth of Hebrew as a modern national language. By the time he wrote this essay, Bialik was a major literary figure at the peak of his career. He was crowned back then within Hebrew literary circles as the national Hebrew poet, the one and only. And residing in Odessa at the time, he had already published a collection of Hebrew poems which was very well received and was a central writer, translator, literary editor, and a major public authority in the Jewish world. So excavating Bialik, Bialik's uh, approach to revival is actually quite important to the understanding of Hebrew revival discourse. And I'm trying to trace that approach through a close reading of um, this relatively early essay, um, and also relatively understudied essay, Language Pangs, which tackles the question of uh, Hebrew revival directly. On the surface, the essay unravels Bialik's concrete plan for adapting Hebrew to some of its new expected roles. 
But on another level, alongside and through the pragmatic linguistic discussion, the text reflects an additional story that lies in its figurative di dimension. If we trace Bialik's figurative language throughout the essay and take his metaphors seriously, so to speak, what we get is a mythic narrative of language revival which is generated by the masculine Hebrew poet. In this myth, language emerges as a feminine path pathological body, neither dead nor alive, pregnant yet unable to give birth. In language pangs, Bialik grapples with the body of the language in order to discuss the steps that must be taken towards its revitalization. As we shall see, the body of Hebrew is not a healthy one, according to Bialik. And the pregnancy and birth metaphors, which are woven in his discussion, also take abnormal forms. So our focus here is the pathology of language. And I take note of the organic, biological, and anatomical imagery that Bialik employs throughout the essay while drawing attention to the sexual and violent tone of these body-centered reflections. So just a few caveats before I get to an actual um, analysis of this essay. Bialik is not exceptional in thinking about language through organic and feminine uh, metaphors. Such metaphors abound in 18th and 19th century philosophy of language and in many of the romantic and symbolist traditions that inform Bialik's thought as they inform the, the discourse of revival in general. Since the 19th century, since uh, Herder practically, language, and particularly the mother tongue, is thought of through its distinctiveness, as embodying the inherent qualities of each and every nation. Languages are thus understood as separate from one another. They become um, uh, defined and, and comparable. Within the discourse of philology, language is seen as a body of knowledge. Michel Foucault famously argued that in the 19th century, and this is a quote, language began to fold in upon itself, to acquire its own particular density. It became one object of knowledge among others on the same level as living beings, wealth and value, and the history of events and men. Within this new understanding of language, the notion of mother tongue becomes increasingly important. Literary scholar Yasmin Yildiz argues that the idea of mother functions as the, the biological and emotional link between language and the nation. So the maternal is a central trope in, uh, in the national imagination, and national languages are often referred to in feminine, maternal, and affective terms. In Hebrew, the grammatical gender of the word language, lashon, or safa, is feminine. Hebrew is a sex maniac. She wants to know who's speaking, writes the poet Yona Volach in her poem Ivrit, Hebrew. Volach protests against Hebrew gendered grammar, which identifies each noun as either masculine or feminine. But of course, in Volach's poem, Hebrew is also per personif personified as a woman. As Volach comments on a long literary tradition in which the Hebrew language is gendered and dramatized as a woman. So Bialik, much earlier than Volach, joins that literary tradition, and so he can very easily base his narrative and metaphor on the feminine gender of the Hebrew noun language, Lashon, referring to Hebrew as a woman, or as a feminine being, and hence the title language pangs. But one final thing we should keep in mind is that Hebrew, unlike many other languages, uh, is not and cannot be conceived as a mother tongue at that time, as opposed to Yiddish, which is considered the monoloshan, the mother tongue. Hebrew in 1905 uh, is not commonly spoken, let alone by women who have little to none access to the language. And of course, women could not, uh, did not have access to Orthodox Jewish education, so they could not acquire the, the Hebrew language in the same way that men could, if they at all acquired it. Hebrew is therefore far from being a mother tongue. In 1905, Bialik himself, who was multilingual, mostly spoke Yiddish, sometimes Russian, definitely not Hebrew. And yet Bialik discusses Hebrew in terms of a pregnant body, a mother-to-be. 
And this tension brings about the understanding of Hebrew as an organic anomaly, which allows Bialik to both stress Hebrew's exceptionality in the form of deficiency or a disease, and to call for and claim the normalization of the language. So language banks in this respect is Bialik's attempt to prescribe a treatment for the sick body of Hebrew and to heal the language. I'm going to go to, to the essay now. In the beginning of language pangs, Bialik indeed diagnoses the Hebrew language as ill. Initially, the illness is related to the digestive power of the language. Bialik argues that a language that does not participate in the constant cycle of linguistic economy, which occurs in everyday conversation, cannot digest properly. That inability of the body to receive and process endangers its vitality and, in Bialik's words, causes its marrow and blood to dwindle so that the dry bones of its philological skeleton begin to show through. Hebrew's disease, then, stems from the fact that it does not draw life from the realm of colloquial conversation. Hebrew literary scholar Hannah Kornfeld reads that analysis as attesting to Bialik's understanding that the life of language is dependent upon its routine use, that is, upon the collocations, idioms, and cliches created in spoken language. In Bialik's own idiom, that colloquial function of language is figured as merchandise in the marketplace, passed from one person to the next. So it is clear from this initial diagnosis that what a language needs in order to be vital is a vernacular function and circular exchange. What is not entirely clear is how would the sick Hebrew get there? Perhaps Bialik offers to democratize Hebrew, to hand it over to the masses and locate it literally in the marketplace of everyday speech. As the essay unfolds, Bialik seems ambivalent about that option. Indeed, mid midway through the essay, he seriously questions the extent to which ordinary users of Hebrew should intervene in the formation of the language. After all, the organic anomaly of Hebrew requires a solution that deviates from the ordinary. In order for it to recover, Bialik contends, Hebrew requires fattening. Namely, it requires an artificial intervention in its lexical expansion, in what should have been a natural process of giving and taking. Gradually, though, Bialik clarifies that not everyone is allowed to take part in such fattening or expansion of the language, only those who are fully versed and knowledgeable about Hebrew are permitted to do so. A particularly special place, a special role is reserved here for Hebrew poets. And this is where Bialik's argument begins to sketch a hierarchy of language users that not only differentiates um, levels of proficiency in the language, but also dis distinguishes the craftsmen <coughs> of language from its true creators and artists. So who is a true creator, according to Bialik? In the essay, he actually uh, elaborates almost inadvertently on this uh, mythic figure of the creator. And we shall note that for Bialik, the creator is exclusively masculine. As we said before, Hebrew uh, nouns have to be either masculine or feminine. So the creator in this essay is always masculine, and, and language is always feminine. So in the translation, I'm keeping these genders. In moments of creation, the creator ascends above language, becomes her master and king, subjugates her to her own will, breaks through her wall while no one protests against him. Furthermore, his very own transgressions sometimes becomes a law or a commandment. Great is the transgression of a creator. It is akin to a strike of lightning over which one blesses or sema severeshit, even if the lightning hits an ancient tree. Creation, which reads as both creation in and of language, is articulated here in terms of transgression and destruction. It involves a violent, perhaps sexually violent, encounter between the creator and language and implies strict gender power relations. It also seems that for Bialik, creation in language is destructive, uh, is a destructive but necessary intervention, almost a form of redemption through sin. 
a messianic religious notion that Bialik translates here to the realm of linguistic creativity. And we shall return to that notion later. In the second half of the essay, Bialik's focus shifts, and he begins to elaborate on a project that, at first glance, seems quite realistic and manageable. He calls for the establishment of an all-encompassing Hebrew dictionary. He calls it the Gathering Dictionary. In Hebrew, it's Milon Mechanis. Bialik clarifies that the practice of fattening, while it improves the quality of the language, does not assist its growth. Rather, the natural growth of the language must come from within. He therefore maintains that a complete knowing of the language from within must precede all other attempts to revive, expand, or enrich her externally. And this is when the interiority of Hebrew, its particular density, becomes crucial. The Engathering Dictionary is meant to capture the distinct character of Hebrew, its integrity, its oneness, that which defines it from within. Bialik stresses that unlike other initiatives, such as the lexical project of the renowned uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, whom I mentioned before, this Engathering Dictionary will not translate or import foreign idioms into Hebrew. It will not be a Russian Hebrew or a German Hebrew dictionary, but rather a Hebrew dictionary. The Engathering Dictionary appeals to the generative power of Hebrew. Bialik stresses that it must enclose the linguistic Hebrew asset in its entire growth and development. This full in gathering, when done properly, will not only widely publicize some unseen treasures of darkness of Hebrew, but it will also open up for us some entrances to expand the language from within. It will show us some new paths that cannot be uh, imagined in advance, paths that flicker from afar to creators and artists alone. So the objective is not only to collect Hebrew's past tradition, but to envision her future. Bialik adds that the dictionary is expected to conquer and clear the path for the new Hebrew grammar. He invokes a need to measure and know the entire force of language without leaving any remnants to the end of her most distant domains. The colonial language of discovery and conquer is not coincidental. The purpose of the dictionary, as the spatial metaphors reveal, is to measure Hebrew, map her as if she were a territory, determine her borders, and, and thereby constitute her as a monolingual national asset. In this sense, the project of ingathering is also a project of inserting the Hebrew language into history, normalizing and universalizing Hebrew. We can now see that Bialik establishes a series of analogies in which the figure of the prophetic masculine Hebrew poet interacts with the feminine bodily language that is at once emblematic of the people, the nation, and the land. In doing so, Bialik echoes the familiar biblical model of heterosexual relations between God and the people, in which God is figured as a man, uh, addressing the nation, which is figured as a woman. The problematics of these relations are re-examined in Bialik's text. He employs these figures in order to narrate them anew, while enacting the national, gendered, and theological tensions that have settled into them. According to Bialik, the dictionary would inaugurate a particular knowing of Hebrew. He announces that what the language is capable of giving, she will eventually give when demanded to. He further clarifies that this new knowing of language through the Engathering Dictionary requires the collaboration of linguists and poets, creators. The Hebrew Dictionary will not be complete unless the best of creators, the artist of languages and style in the Israeli nation, will participate in its writing. The scientists will contribute to the dictionary from their scientificity, their expertise, and their meticulous research, and the artists from their subtle feeling, their refined taste, and their power of fertilization. And from all of them together, something complete and repaired would come about. According to Bialik, literature and philology supplement one another. Creators, artists of language and style would fertilize Hebrew but they are only able to do so with the help of linguists. 
those who constitute language as a body of knowledge. Bialik indeed maintains that grammar must, must first see the entire body and organs of the language as they are dissembled and rejoined, and the dictionary would show that. In Bialik's narrative, then, the revival of Hebrew, its institutionalization as national, requires laying the body of the language on the operating table of the philological laboratory and fertilizing it. One could barely ignore the violent, indeed sexually violent connotations of this image, which joins the language of conquest, subjugation, and mastery that recurs in the text. That is a type of treatment recommended for language, and that is what the conspiracy between linguists and poets would allow. Bialik is reclaiming the role of poets in the project of national revival, stressing their enlivening power. Recalling the earlier description of the figure of the creator, whose creation appears as a form of redemption through sin, we can now observe that in his discussion of revival, the national the Hebrew poet claims the nationalization of the Hebrew by inscribing himself into her history through the transgressive act of impregnating the language. And indeed, the pregnancy which is implied in the title returns towards the end of the essay. Bialik explains that unlike normative uh, vital languages, our language, which is seemingly alive, much more than what she births, remains enfolded in her womb, enfolded in her womb after a while and needs to be delivered. And her dictionary should therefore not merely gather the asset, but provide in gathering alongside fertilization and enhancement, a sort of assistance in her labor. The pregnant body of Hebrew, which according to Bialik is neither dead, nor fully alive, bears its fetus, fetuses without giving birth. The complication of this pregnancy summoned the intervention of Hebrew poets, who are called upon to both assist the language in her labor and once again fertilize. It is not entirely clear who or what needs to be fertilized at this point. Is it the language who is already pregnant or that which is being born? The image which borders on incest positioned the Hebrew poet as both father and midwife. He should both impregnate the semi-dead language and redeem her from her disastrous state by the act of delivery. What is described here, I would like to argue, is a desire to circumscribe language and gain absolute control over her generative power. But within the text, that desire remains unfulfilled with respect to his own vision. The Alex project of the Ingathering Dictionary is necessarily a failing one, as the text itself declares that something in language refuses to reveal itself. There is a remainder within language, both inherent and foreign. It is at once the creation of the poet, but also something he cannot grasp. Throughout the essay, Bialik expresses a wish to encompass language in its entirety, the fantasy of forcefully extracting what is folded in the body of language demonstrates at once that desire and its unfulfillment. This is a haunted fantasy that is fed from the wish to obtain mastery over something that keeps on evading control. The text repeatedly suggests that power must be wielded over the language in the course of its institutionalization as a body of knowledge. At the same time, the text echoes a resistance to this power. Bialik expresses a will to govern Hebrew while underscoring that which is uncontrollable in the language. Hebrew maintains her fetuses in her womb. Masha valdotea bemeiha. By the end of the essay, the compulsive tendency uh, that we see here becomes even more extreme. The attempt to know language is presented as exploitive and totalitarian. The dictionary should exploit the Hebrew language for all of her revealed and concealed powers to the edge of all knowledge and sense. 
namely all of the linguistic matter from all of the generations with all of its different uses have to be fully exhausted in the dictionary from every possible angle. That this fantasy of mastery radicalizes as the text unfolds attests to the fact that indeed there is still an element within language that is untainable, that does not yield to the violent imposition of nationalization and does not lend itself to the creator's growing demands. In the beginning of the essay, Bialik highlighted the importance of linguistic pragmatics and praised the routine use of languages spoken by, by the masses. Now, the ingathering dictionary is hailed to discipline, organize, and decipher the language, to mark her traits and encompass her, encompass her from every possible angle. Although Bialik states that it is first and foremost spoken language that is essential for the life of Hebrew, he returns again and again to the prominence of the romantic figure of the poet, whose divine creative forces are presented as truly life-giving. Feminist critique has long debated the masculine appropriation of birth as a trope employed to describe artistic creation simultaneously with the exclusion of women from the creative process. And of course, we see that gesture at work in Bialik's text. But another effect of the conceptualization of artistic creation as birth is that it is often entwined with the notion of a latent monstrosity that might emerge as the offspring of imaginative creation. So I would like to end by imagining the potential monstrosity that the remainder of Hebrew might bear. The Alex text reflects a shared anxiety that um, the implications of Hebrew revival might be beyond the control of those attempting to revive the language. In fact, revival in and of itself affirms neither a temporality nor an agency that operates in its background. It does not stage a clear, determined relationship between reviver and revived. In other words, it's not entirely clear in this figurative framework whether it is the poet that revives the language or the language that revives the poet. This inherent abstraction of revival complicates any assumed linearity or strict power relations that might be construed from it. Moreover, the interplay between the purported objects of revival language, the literature, the nation, the Hebrew subject. It further uh, problematized the question of who or what is reviving and who or what is being revived. The result is indeed evident anxiety about the uncontrollable effects of acting in language. An anxiety that speaking Hebrew might transform not only the language, but its speakers too. In Bialik's essay, Hebrew embodies an organic anomaly. It bears something that infinitely exceeds the control of the creator, something irreducible that cannot be contained within the constraints of the national lexicon. So might we talk about the teratology of Hebrew? And if so, what type of threat would such monstrosity pose the integrity of the nation and of the singular subject who is said to have created it? Will this golem rise against its makers? Thank you. Thank you.